Our second theme of discussion today, brothers and sisters, deals with the role of the living prophet. I want to uh, emphasize that word living in more than one way. As it pertains to the prophet, we're talking about the prophet who is alive and who holds the keys of the kingdom at a particular period. And as of now, that is President Ezra Taft Benson. But I'd like to have you see the word living or life in a broader sense than just that we've got a living person who is speaking. Uh, for example, in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> is speaking of uh, Christ, and he says, But now it made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I ponder on that for a while because it's very important. The gospel is not merely a theological system. It's not merely putting together the jigsaw puzzle. All the statements that we know of pertaining to where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. The gospel is not merely a social order and a social program and a way of life. The gospel is, in the most literal sense of meaning, a plan of life, in that through the gospel there is the infusion into the individual of powers, literal powers of life, living powers, that quicken, that animate, that enliven, that enlighten a person's life and actually transform that person, Paul uses the word translated, translated us into the kingdom of Christ, literally transform that person to a higher order of life and of being. In 3 Nephi chapter 14, for example, the Savior makes this statement to the Nephites. Straight is the gate, and it's spelled S-T-R-A-I-T, which means now, like the Strait of Magellan, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then you have Nephi saying over here in Second Nephi chapter thirty-three, just as he's signing off his writings in the in the Book of Mormon and talking about his uh, feelings for both the Jews and Gentiles. He adds this comment, But behold, for none of these can I hope, except they shall be reconciled unto Christ, and enter into the narrow gate, and walk in the straight path which leads to life, and continue in the path unto the end of the day of probation. Now, the gospel, then, is a plan of life. Let me just take the Savior's comments and run through a few of them with you. Uh, let's begin with John chapter 6, where the Savior is speaking. And you have to kind of really think and ponder this thing through and not let it go in order to finally understand, because it's, it's, worth, it's worth the effort. You, you see the gospel in a much more meaningful way. Verse 63 of John 6. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now, that doesn't mean very much to us today. The gods of America are those uh, who have physical agility, and I'm not uh, being cantankerous or uh, sour grapeism. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, and I'm not saying that it's, that it's inappropriate to develop physical prowess and that kind of thing. I'm just saying you don't worship it. You don't worship it, as we are doing today. It's, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, 
and they are life. They're actually the transmission of life. When a person speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, there's actually a, a power of life this way and that way right through. I've seen that in actual experience to the point where I could see it. Just literally, boom, boom, out like that. And you feel, not only feel, but see the flow of the Spirit. And that's a marvelous kind of thing. But the point I want to make is this, that uh, the gospel is a program to, to infuse life and truth and power into fallen, unregenerate people. You have weaknesses. And uh, elevate them as they apply the principles of moral and spiritual discipline in their lives also. Elevate them finally back to where they have eternal life, which is to have the fullness of celestial glory or power. Now, uh, over in chapter uh, 10, for example, of the book of John, Jesus speaking, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, not just the abundant life in the sense that you get your life established on good principles. Now, that's an abundant life. But coupled with that, the infusion of spiritual truth and power from God. Be a sunflower. Sunflower knows enough to get its face toward the sun because there's something coming. And we need to get our face toward the S-O-N because there is something coming from him to us. He is the light and the life of the world. And when our lives are centered in this way, then we begin to get that flow. In uh, chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, there's two things. Resurrection, putting your spirit back into your body, and also the life. And the ultimate fulfillment of that is the endowment of the individual with celestial glory so that he's a being like the Father and the Son who are in the sacred grove, with a brilliance of light and life and power within that person that will eclipse the light of the sun at noonday. See? Now, think of yourselves as beings like the Father and the Son were. That's the great destiny of the gospel, to infuse new life, not just to remit sins, not just to resurrect, but to infuse life and sanctify and transform and change and finally endow with a celestial glory. That's the purpose of the gospel. Dare to be like the Father and the Son were in the first vision, because that's your destiny. You see that? Over here, for example, again now, in, in uh, uh, first in, in, in John 14, he says this uh, in uh, verse 6, for example, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now he said then that the gospel is a, is a plan of life, and that doesn't mean merely that it's a plan by which you could establish and regulate your life. Again, it's the plan by which you can have infused into your life new truths, new powers, new quickening influences that are even more dynamic than the light of the sun is to the sunflower, see, and eventually be glorified in that. Now, that's an important point when we talk about the role of the prophet. That's an important point to keep that, that one in mind. Now, the word is spirit. When we talk about the word of the Lord, in the sense that I would use that term here, the word of the Lord is not contained in that book, and that's the standard works of the Church. That is not the word of the Lord. That is merely a publication containing a bunch of symbols, which we call letters, and put together in words of the English language. The word of the Lord is spirit. The word of the Lord is a living, dynamic power. Here in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 43, And I have given to you a commandment to beware concerning yourselves and give heed to the words of eternal life, 
for you should live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, and note how he then explains it. For the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. So the word of the Lord then is truth, it's light, it's spirit, and it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord is a substance. It's a pure, fine substance, which we call the glory of, of Christ, his spirit, his power. And it's filled with the attributes and intellectual qualities of his mind. And it has the capability to transfer those from him to us and to transfer the life of him as a glorified being to us and build that within us. And the great goal then is to be sanctified and glorified in that. Now, when we are born again, then we are born by living power into a newness of life. Over here in First Peter, for instance, you have uh, the chief apostle making the uh, this statement here in uh, chapter 1, verse 25, 23, rather, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, when we are baptized, then, we actually enter in a covenant relationship into a newness of life. Note how the Apostle Paul puts this in, in uh, Romans chapter 6. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We put away our old life, our old man, and we did it in the act symbolizing death. And we put ourselves into a grave, a watery grave, symbolic of the tomb. And we did this voluntarily then. He says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. But like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. Now that newness of life comes through Jesus Christ. For example, uh, verse 11 of Romans 8, If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we, have, we, are, uh, we are debtors not of the flesh, but to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. See? Well, now, when we're talking about, about this, then we're talking about a program in which we are new creatures in Christ. And uh, this new creature in Christ business is very, very real. As the Paul says, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be, in the inspired revision, changes that to live. Therefore, if any man live in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay? Now, the Church, then, is a living body. Paul calls it the body of Christ. Okay? Uh, it's not a robot. It's not designed that a person should be moved around like a billiard player moves a ball. It's not designed that that be. It's designed instead that through faith and through our eye being single to God, we acquire new life. And part of that new life experience, then, is revelatory life, life of revelation with the gifts of the Spirit. And that we as individuals, each of us, each of us is alive spiritually. And as members of the Church, we each have gifts of the Spirit, a gift or multiple gifts of the Spirit. And those gifts are not talents. Sad is the time when we equate gifts with talents. Gifts, then, are endowments through the Holy Ghost. Talents are something that you develop within yourself, 
by your own proficiency and your own skill and means. Now, there is a correlation between the two, yes, but a gift. Who, who can develop the talent of speaking in tongues? Who can develop the talent merely through your skill to heal? Who can develop the talent to prophesy and tell us of things in the future merely by human talent? See? The only way you can do any of those things is if there is an infusion of power which is life and which is revelatory coming from up there into you and you speak as a manifestation of it. And those are gifts. Now, the Church is a living body. It's designed to be each person to be alive and not to be moved around. There may be times when the Lord proves and tries your soul and gives you some instructions, and maybe a bishop does this, and maybe he or you say, well, my opinion of that is as good as his. But then there's the issue of obedience, and there's the issue then of whether you're in tune, the issue of how you're going to answer your conduct when you start stand before the Lord and give him account, see? The point of the matter is that we're dealing now with a living body, with life and revelation from Christ to each person and each unit, with a living prophet and other living priesthood authorities to direct us. That's what we're talking about, see? <clears throat> and then it's in that setting that you talk about the role of the living prophet. Over here in 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the, about the Church. And uh, he says uh, this concerning it, verse 27 and verse 28, God hath set some in the Church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? And the answer is no. Are all parts of your body the eye, are all parts of the body your left hand, or your right hand? No. But all of them then are a part of a living organism, and there's life in the living organism. And uh, there should be a life in the individual. There should be life in a quorum president. And interestingly, that life corresponds with the scope of responsibility that's yours. If it's only individual, then it pertains to you as an individual. If you're president of an elders' quorum, you have the right to the spirit of revelation so that you see and understand and perceive it the needs of members of that quorum. You may not even talk with them, and the Spirit will open it to you. If you're a bishop, then you are the focal point of revelation for that ward. I've served in that office, and I've served in the state presidency, and I know what the mantle is. The mantle, then, is an endowment, and that mantle is revelatory, and that mantle has a quality of love about it that supersedes the love that you have within yourself. Because that mantle is Christ. It's his life. It's his gifts. It's his power. And we're talking now about a living body, living people in the living program. Now, within the Church, there are basically two channels. Maybe this is an arbitrary way of saying it, but for the purpose of discussion, let me do so. There are two channels of the Spirit which open the Spirit to the individual. Now, the first channel, then, is the, is the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then included with that, then, the higher ordinances of the gospel. And this gift is the most precious and important gift that a human being can have. You can learn more through the gift of the Spirit and the gift of the Holy Ghost than you can by any academic program whatever. You can go on through and get your Ph.D., and I've got four college degrees. As far as the Lord's concerned, they're not worth the paper they're written on. They do open doors, and they give you a little status to stand on, and if you're humble, then you can use them for a benefit, see? But other than that, they're, they're really not worth much. It takes a lot of work to get them, and you get a respect, then, for the intellectual processes. <clears throat> but let me just tell you this and bear you my testimony that the gift of the Holy Ghost is far more meaningful than the libraries of every university on earth combined. If you apply that, you can have a flow of revelation in your life that just is a new life. It's a new it's just a new program. 
And uh, that flow of revelation never ceases. You can have the Spirit teach you. You can have it counsel you. You can have it open things to your knowledge. You it can have you given warnings, etc., and so forth. See, you can have all those things, and uh, it will lead you to the knowledge of all things. It will finally bring you up to where you converse personally with Christ and uh, have a knowledge of all things. Now, that's the greatest gift that you can have. Now, along with that, then, are the higher gifts of the of the temple. When you talk about the holy endowment, then uh, you're talking about something that's endowed upon you, something that's placed upon you. And uh, the ceremony of the holy endowment is designed to give the higher revelations and endowments of the Spirit to the individual. I was released from the High Council of the Alpine State here earlier in the year, and President Bangladesh who used to be a general authority and he's been in this area, being president of the Jordan River Temple, which is not in our district, but nevertheless being a member of our stake and being there uh, a few days afterward, and May and I get a call on if we will come to the Jordan Temple and chat with the brethren. So we go over. And he says, We're authorized to give you a call to serve as ordinance workers and officiators in the Jordan River Temple. I says, hey, we're not even in the Temple District. We're not even batted an eye. <clears throat> we are authorized to call. And so before we got out of the Temple, we had been set apart, and we've had the glorious experience of uh, participating in that sacred program two days a week, and of pondering anew from the inside, as it were, uh, that which goes on. And when it takes 3,000 people to run the Jordan River Temple, you know that there's a lot that goes on backstage. But it's, it's a real experience. And uh, uh, as I've, for example, been administering the sacred initiatory ordinances, as one good brother there, when he administers them, he doesn't just say the words correctly. I mean, there's a spiritual power there. And I've just sat down, and we've only had maybe one or two people in a little time, and listened to him, and I just said, Lord, I'm just in agony. Hey, I can say the words. But that guy's got the power, and you just feel the flow of the Spirit, see. But it gets you, it gets you close, then, to, to, the, to the temple as a source of spiritual communication and endowment. Remember when I first received my endowments, I was a young man about 19 years old, just turned 19, wasn't going on a mission or anything. But uh, Dad and I decided it might be a good idea. That's where the Idaho Falls Temple was built, and we were living in the Idaho Falls area. So we went on an excursion down to the Logan Temple, and, and there I received my endowments. But I can still remember the change. It was just like putting on a warm coat on a chilly day. Just the radiance of the Spirit. I can, I can still remember that. And I didn't quite know what it was, except I would stand and kind of blink and wonder about it. But there was, there was an endowment that came that I could literally feel. Now, there's that kind of thing that's open to every Latter-day Saint. If your lives are in harmony and in tune, and you begin to feel it. And this is a revelatory thing. The Prophet Job in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenant says, God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit. Verse 26, by the way. Yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost that has not been revealed since the world was until now, which our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectations to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels as held and reserved for the fullness of their glory, a time to come into which nothing shall be withheld, whether there be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest. All thrones and dominions and principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all those who have endured faithfully for the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and also if there be bound set to the heavens or to the seas or to the dry lands or the sun, moon, and stars. And he says all the times of their revolutions and all the appointed days, months, and years and all the days of their days and months and years shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And then he says this, 
as well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River <coughs> in its decreed course, <coughs> or to turn it upstream, as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. See? Now, there's one challenge, and there's one channel, but it's only one out of two. <coughs> there is another channel, and of the two of them, the second is supreme. The second is supreme. <coughs> and that second one is the flow of the living priesthood through a prophet and through living administrators, state presidencies, bishoprics, quorum presidencies, see. And of the two, as I said, the latter is superior. If uh, you're teaching your children, if you could just teach them two things. And two things only. You got these ingrained in their lives. What would those two things be? Would they be to memorize the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments? What would they be? You think about it. As I see it, there would be two things. Number one, teach them how to get the Spirit of the Lord in their lives. And number two, teach them to follow the living prophet. And in priority, number two would be one. Now that's the priority, see. Uh, this gets us, for example, to a program of ministering rather than administering. The Church is not a well-oiled Gentile corporation that runs smoothly because we learn the arts of administration. That's not the goal of the Church. The goal of the Church is Fourth Nephi, where every man partakes of the gifts of the Spirit, and we're all free and partakers of the heavenly gifts. See? The goal isn't merely administration, the goal is ministration. And ministration is the art of teaching divine truth and infusing the power of the Holy Spirit into the people. That's the art of ministry. And uh, it's that kind of thing that, uh, that President Benson is talking about, <clears throat> for example, when, he's, when he deals with church organization. He says, if uh, we spend, he says, often we spend great effort in trying to increase the activity level of our stakes. We work diligently to raise the percentages of those att attending uh, sacrament meetings. <clears throat> we labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the numbers of those marrying in the temple. All of those are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. But when individual members and families emerge themselves in the scriptures, regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be united, fortified. Personal revelation will flow. And he goes on to say, Feast upon the words of Christ. Learn the doctrine. Master the principles that are found therein. There are few other efforts that will bring greater dividends to your callings. There are few words, few ways to gain greater inspiration as you serve. See? Now, when we're talking about a living church, and we're talking about each person alive in Christ, and we're talking about a flow of life and of revelation through ordained channels, centering in a living oracle, a living prophet, who is alive physically, but more fully, who is alive spiritually, and who is the source of the directive power for that kingdom in a revelatory way. And this program, then, is that of ministry. I have here in, the, in my uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenants over in section 43, and we'll get to that just a little bit later as we talk about uh, the role of the prophet as the Lord speaks of it in that section. 
But uh, let me just say it at this point. I have here in the margin of uh, this old beat-up volume, which I'm going to retire one of these days and put a sign on it, rest in pieces, uh, the keys to the kingdom constitute the gospel ministratively. The keys to the kingdom constitute the gospel ministratively, not administratively, but ministratively, see? They're the, that's the source of the flow. Now, Alma's injunction, for example, in Alma 18, when he organized the church there at the Waters of Mormon, what did he tell them? And this is a vital thing, it's a vital key to how we should conduct ourselves. Verse 19 of, of Mosiah 18, and he commanded them that they should teach nothing save it were the things which he had taught them and which had been spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets. Yea, even he commanded them they should preach nothing save it were repentance and faith in the Lord who had redeemed his people. And he put it this way, that the living prophet sets the bounds of church doctrine, and those bounds may differ from prophet to prophet, and they may differ downwardly as well as upwardly. They may differ downwardly. <clears throat> in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord talks about the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is this living power. Jesus is the center of it. And for this reason, Christ is called by, as one of his names, the spirit of truth. And that spirit then flows from him to a living church and to living people who are alive in him, alive in Christ. And uh, that spirit flows to living prophets who teach and who direct. But if there is a truth in the sense of a letter that is taught without the spirit of truth, without the living principle, then that written letter is a false doctrine, regardless of how true it may be intrinsically. Now, for example, the principle of plural marriage has certain false doctrines associated with it for us today. That isn't true in Brigham Young's day, but it is true of us today. Now, there's some aspects of plural marriage today that are true. If a young man marries a wife and they marry in the temple, <clears throat> they marry for time and eternity, and they live for, say, three or four or five years, and then she dies, and he then <clears throat> is left alone, and uh, he, after due and appropriate time, then uh, enters into another relationship and marries another young lady in the temple. He can marry her for time and eternity, and she is his plural wife. Okay? Now, that doctrine is true. But if you go out and say, in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord reveals there the principle of plural marriage. And it's there in written letters, and you can read it and understand the rationale of the idea. And you then say, as people today still do, therefore, let's go to and practice plural marriage. Now, when you get to the point that you teach with the intent of admonishing obedience, you teach plural marriage with the intent of admonishing obedience, you are teaching false doctrine. You are teaching something that is not the word of God. It may be the letter, but it is not the word. The word is life. The word is spirit. The word is the living revelation of God through living prophets. And those then who teach and practice plural marriage and other doctrines that have been taught in the past irregardless of their merit, intrinsically, are teaching false doctrine. Because the living prophet is head of a living church, and that church is alive in Christ, and anything that is outside of the will and the law of Christ through that living prophet is dead. And sometimes it's putrid and stinks. Now that is the basis, then on which the Church operates. And so it is not appropriate for a person to dig things up of the past and then teach them as truths. 
if the living prophet has not sanctioned them. Now, there's no check on how much revelation a person can receive. The Book of Mormon teaches that very dramatically. Ask yourself the question, for example, who in the Book of Mormon taught the Nephite people, take this thousand-year period from Lehi down to Moroni, that thousand-year period, in that thousand-year period, who taught the Nephite people the greatest and most sublime truths? Who did? And the answer is not Christ in his personal ministry to them. The answer is not the prophets. Who is the answer? The little children. Do you know what it's recorded? Now, why did Moroni put that, I mean, Mormon put that in there? The Book of Mormon is a tailor-made book, and he didn't record everything that went on when Jesus visited them. But he put that one in there. Why? <clears throat> what did it teach us? That there is no limitation to the revelation you can get as a person, regardless of how old you are or what sex you are. There is no limitation to the revelation that you can get. But let me tell you, there is a limitation on what you can do with it. The role of the living prophet judges that one. And when we push beyond what the living prophet would say, we do wrong. The Lord has blessed me, for example, personally with a spiritual gift. It's called the gift of knowledge. It's one of the plagues of my life, has been. Because as I read the scriptures at times, it just seems like the neon lamps turn on, and the spirit, boom, boom, here's what it means. And then, with great joy and happiness, I go and tell someone, and they say, I don't see that. And then I have the challenge at times of uh, just keeping within the bounds. And sometimes I get a little enthusiastic. <laughs> And you don't know quite where the bounds are. <laughs> and I've learned, and I'm trying, I'm still working at that, just literally working at it as a major objective. Lord, what is the bounds? What are the bounds as they pertain to me? And can I be sensitive enough to the Spirit where the Spirit begins to say, uh-uh, that's enough to back off? Now, that's the kind of thing that we have to do, see? That's the kind of thing that we have to do. All right, so Alma's injunction, very, very definite. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are open, and uh, again, though, priesthood channels are the basis, then, of determining how much is given. See, as Latter-day Saints, we ought to meet together instead of just telling some little emotional story that appeals to emotion. And we think we've got the spirit because someone begins to feel emotional about it. <clears throat> now, there's a difference between emotion and the spirit. The spirit is emotional. It does. It has a power in it. If you want to get the power of the spirit, you teach the scriptures. Unfold what they say. Don't just play on emotion. They unfold the scriptures. Unfold the truths of eternal life. And exercise the gifts. And if we were living as we really ought to then, as we come together in a, in a meeting, then the gifts of the Spirit ought to be there, the Spirit of prophecy, the Spirit of revelation, the gift of tongues, <clears throat> the interpretation. If we don't have these, we're really not where we should be in the gospel. That's the message of the Book of Mormon. But in the midst of all this, the Lord says this in section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and all these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God, verse 27 now, and unto the bishop of the church, and to such as God shall appoint and ordain to watch over the church, and to be elders unto the church, or to have it given to them to discern all those gifts, lest there shall be any among you professing, and yet not be of God. Now you may have a gift, but when it comes to expressing it among the saints, then you're subject to the living administrator in regard to what you do. You see that? And that's the basic idea. Okay? <clears throat> now, the danger is then that uh, people then begin to believe that they, because they have the spirit of revelation, that therefore it came from the Lord, and therefore what he tells me, therefore I can do. 
And sometimes the Lord doesn't have too many inhibitions in what he tells you. He can reveal truths that go beyond what the prophet teaches. For example, I'll give you an illustration in church history. Lorenzo Snow was a young man, <clears throat> before he was ever a member of the church, went to Kirtland. And he sat in on what they called then a blessing meeting. A blessing meeting was conducted by President, uh, I mean, Patriarch uh, Joseph Smith, Jr., the prophet's father. <clears throat> and he said, we're going to have a blessing meeting tonight. And he had a recorder there, and anyone that comes and wanted to get a, a, a patriarchal blessing, it could come. And he would talk to him for a while and then say, okay, and who wants to have a patriarchal blessing? Well, uh, Lorenzo Snow was at one of those meetings. And he was, he was impressed, very much so. He wasn't a member yet. And he walked up to Joseph Smith Sr. and began talking with him. And Joseph Smith Sr. had the spirit of revelation. And he says, Brother Snow, the day will come when you'll be a member of the church, and you will become as big as you want to be, even as big as God is. Now, that's a powerful one to lay on to anybody together. <laughs> and he pondered that, and he pondered that on through the curtain period where he joined the church, clear on through into the Nauvoo period, and he was finally pondering it. Then the whole flood of revelation opened up to him, and he formed that popular couplet, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. But the footnote to that is this. While he got that revelation, he didn't teach it. He says, I kept it to myself until I heard Joseph Smith the prophet talk on the doctrine, and then I felt free to express it to others. You see that? Now, that's the key, and that's the check. So there's two channels, and don't get caught up because you think it's true, and it is true, and then become your own revelator, and then you become your own prophet, and then you cut yourself off from the living body, and your quest for truth is the very thing that cuts you off, because the element of pride comes in there. You know what President Benson has said about that one? The element of pride comes in, and uh, it's just this simple. We can't be saved, for example, without our dead. Now, we all know that. Salvation is a family matter. And uh, it's just this simple. We can't be saved, for example, without our dead. Now, we all know that. Salvation is a family matter. Neither can we be saved without prophets, apostles, state presidencies, and bishops, because they constitute the channels through which the spirit of life and revelation and wisdom and guidance and even discipline flow. Now, I've been involved in that disciplinary action and feature of things. We held a high council court, for example, one time that started at 7 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and it went clear through the day and on into the evening. And I got home at 1 o'clock the morning after, and we had had two 10-minute breaks. But the spirit of revelation was there, and when that decision came down, there wasn't an issue in regard to it. The spirit of revelation flowed, I say that. And uh, so that's the beautiful thing about it. And I've been close enough, at least administratively, on some levels to know that that is an actuality. All right, now, the idea of spiritual development is that uh, faith is not mere belief but the capacity to acquire the Spirit of the Lord and the gifts of the Spirit. The Prophet Joseph Smith, for example, put it uh, uh, this way as he spoke of the gifts here in the uh, teachings. This is page 270 and 71 of the, of the teachings of the Prophet compiled by President Joseph Fielding Smith. He says, Because faith is wanting, the, the fruits are. No man since the world was had faith without having something along with it. The ancients quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Women received their dead. By faith the worlds were made. A man who has none of the fruits or the gifts has no faith. And he deceives himself if he supposes that he has. Faith has been wanting not only among the heathens but in professed Christendom also, so that tongues, healings, prophecies, prophets and apostles and all the gifts and blessings have been wanting. See, Now, if we have faith, you'll have the gifts of the Spirit. You'll have the Spirit of Revelation. 
if we don't have the spirit of revelation and we don't have the gifts of the spirit, then we don't have faith. And we need to heed the prophet and await because we are a church under condemnation. Not only for that reason, but for higher reasons that people who understand the Book of Mormon understand. <clears throat> Secondly, then, we must acquire and internalize the spiritual power in its gifts. As the prophet put it, he says, uh, it's not enough merely to enjoy reading the revelations of, other, of God to other people. He says, reading the experiences of others, the revelations to them, can never give us a comprehensive view of our condition and true relation to God. Knowledge of these things can only be obtained by experience through the ordinances of God. And those ordinances, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the temple, and through priesthood leaders, priesthood channels, these can only be given to us through experience, through the ordinances of the God set for that purpose. And then he goes on, he says, I assure the saints that truth in reference to these matters can be made known through the revelations of God in the way of his ordinances. Not that just revelation like you're out in a camp meeting and you feel like you've had some inspiration. Revelation in the way of his ordinances, through the gift of the Holy Ghost, through the living of oracles, through those who are appointed appropriately to teach and to direct. See, he says, the Hebrew church came under the spirits of just men made perfect. They got clear up here into the realm of the second comforter blessings. Came into the spirits of just men made perfect, and through the innumerable company of angels, and the God the Father, and Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. He says, what did they learn by coming to the spirits of just men made perfect? Is it written? He says, no. <clears throat> what they learned has not been and could not be written. He says, what object then was gained by this communication? And then he answers very significantly, it was the established order of the kingdom of God. Now, what's the order? It's to exercise faith, to begin to get the spirit, and to finally come like the brother of Jared back into God's presence. And it's a personal, individual thing. Section 76 talks about those who get to the celestial kingdom. And uh, it indicates that they are they who have paid this kind of price. Note how the wording is expressed. Note how the wording is expressed. It says, for instance, here in uh, uh, verse 67, these are they who have come. And the wording is past tense. These are they who have come. They've been there. They've, by their experience, arrived up there. See, these are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the General Assembly and Church of Enoch and of the Firstborn. This can be rather easy to determine who makes the celestial kingdom. The Lord just looks around and says, who's got the head above the veil? Okay, come on, here, you're in the celestial kingdom. And who hasn't got their heads above the veil? Well, then you're something less than celestial. See, we get the idea that our life is like being placed on a, on a, on a balanced scales, and the Lord's going to take all these things that are evil and wrong and put them on one end and all the good deeds on the other, and he's going to balance them off. And we just hope the good outbalances the evil. Well, that whole line of thinking is idiotic. First of all, if you come into Christ, he just pays the debt of that, and that's all forgotten about, isn't it? And then secondly, the issue is that there's something in addition in the gospel plan to the preparatory gospel. The preparatory gospel is faith, repentance, and baptism by which you get the barrier cleared away on all the crud taken off the balance scales. That's the preparatory gospel, see? But in addition to that, then there's the everlasting gospel. And the everlasting gospel is the plan of life that leads to eternal life. It's like living water springing up into everlasting life. It's the thing Jesus was talking about. He says, I am the bread of life. It's something that nourishes, that feeds. See, And then the issue is, have you grown in that to where you finally come up? And thank goodness we got through into the spirit world and to the resurrection to make that determination rather than having to do it all here. But the point is, when you get to the day of judgment, the question will be, how many of those who have come, how many are there who have come up to celestial presence? And they are celestial, and it's just that simple and that easy. Okay?
Mm-hmm. And there may be judgments above that in regards to where you fit in the celestial kingdom and so forth. Now, the doctrine of covenants <clears throat> is a revelation that gives us important keys of insight into this, and there are three revelations primarily that are important <clears throat> on this subject. One is section 21, which was given the day the church was organized. <clears throat> The second one is section 28, which is given later that fall. And then there's section 43, which comes a little after that one. Now, when the church was organized, there were two priesthood leaders in the church. There was Joseph and Oliver. And uh, you had then a first and a second elder relationship in regard to priesthood functions. They were... uh, uh, apostles, both of them. They were prophets. They, had, they received the holy apostleship and so forth. See? But as the Lord instructed them on that day, he says this, beginning with verse 4. Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. Now that's a powerful statement. That has tremendous significance. What the Lord is here saying, that when you listen to the living prophet, that what he says is just as though Christ had said it himself. And your responsibility to heed it and to obey and to internalize and apply it is just as great as though Jesus himself had said it. That's what he's saying. That is the stature of the living prophet. That is the stature of the living prophet. And our responsibility then is to accept that on that premise, on that basis. And then note what he says about the benefits that follow. How dealing uh, as we read this, go back now and pick up this idea that we're, that we're a living body and that there are channels. There's the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's the temple ordinances. There's channels of power. But there's also channels of priesthood power. And if we put all of those into operation, what then is the benefit spiritually? And know what he says. So by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you, Yea, the Lord will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and for your name's glory, for his name's glory. In other words, there will be power infused into this body that we call the church. And even so much that the elements themselves will be subject to that power. Now that's what the Lord is saying if we were in full harmony with the living prophet. Now, having said that, then, uh, some of the saints didn't really pick up on it very fast. One of these was Oliver Cowdery, who was the second elder in the church. Oliver had a brother-in-law by the name of Hiram Page. Both Oliver and Hiram Page had married Whitmer daughters, sisters to uh, John and, and Peter Whitmer. And so they're kind of tied in family-wise. And Hiram Page, while uh, knocking around out in the woods one day, found a stone. Uh, It's just about that round and that shape, if I can put it that way. That round and that shape. And about that thick. And there were two holes drilled through it, about that far apart. Now, that stone is still in existence. The reorganized church has it, and uh, I was visiting their headquarters here some years ago and asked if I could see it, and they were, they were kind enough to let me look at it, and I took and drew on a piece of paper the outlines of the stone and so forth. Someone has treated it rather badly because it's been broken right down the middle, and they, when I saw it, they had a piece of electrical tape, <clears throat> this black electrical tape that they wrapped the thing around to hold the two ends together. See? But uh, Hiram Page had found this stone. And I guess because it had holes that are rather narrow for your eyes to get in, you kind of had to look squeeze eyes or cross eyed to get into them. But he was looking through that stone and 
claimed to receive revelation, and he was he was running them off by the by the batch. And uh, there was quite a lot of interest on certain copies at the time, and he was running revelations off. And even Oliver, his brother-in-law, said, "Hey, we got another prophet in the church," and kind of began supporting him. And when we came to the second general conference of the church, the conference in the fall of 1831. This was the thing was on the agenda. We've got another prophet in the church, and how are we going to work this out so that Joseph Smith can move over a little bit? Well, uh, Newell Knight, who was uh, uh, my priesthood leader in the church at Colesville, down in the southern part of the state of, of New York, came up to that conference as a representative of the of the, of the branch that he was uh, leading in. And uh, he stayed with the prophet Joseph Smith that night before the conference. <clears throat> and he says that the prophet never slept that night. He says uh, he spent the whole night in prayer and meditation about this problem. Now there's a real example of the concern and the interest of the prophet Joseph. He says that when <clears throat> conference began next day, the prophet had such an endowment of power. He was just literally shook as he walked with the endowment of power that he had, that there was just no question as to who was the prophet and who had the keys. And in the course, then, of that uh, conference, the prophet was given section 28 of the Doctrine and Covenants. <clears throat> and it's directed initially toward Oliver Cowdery, because Oliver is the second elder of the Church, and Oliver then uh, ought to have some relationship with Joseph, and, and uh, so the Lord approaches Oliver first and then tells him to go get higher page corrected and so forth. But note what he says, verse 2, Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., for he receiveth them even as Moses. And thou shalt be obedient to the things which I shall give unto him even as Aaron to declare faithfully the commandments and the revelations with power and authority unto the Church. I am speaking now to Oliver, and if thou art led at any time by the Comforter to speak or teach, or at all times by the way of commandment unto the Church, thou mayest do it, but thou shalt not write by way of commandment, but by way of wisdom. Now a visiting brother comes, for example, to the Snowflake Stake. And he gives you direction. This is the word and the will of the Lord to you. But does that person then have the right to make that commandment to the whole church? The answer is no. It's the flow of the Spirit and the living revelation to you. When it comes to, to, to uh, writing, then you can write by commandment, and you can write by wisdom. And there's only one man in the church that can write by commandment. And who's that? That's the living prophet. And all other people in the church write by way of wisdom. Now, we've got church literature written by men who are not and have not been the prophet. That which they write should be accepted how? As wisdom. Not as the law of the Church, but as wisdom. The living prophet only writes by way of commandment. You see that? However eloquently a person may write, and like James E. Cowings could write eloquently, I envy the ability they have to put words into sentences. But James E. Talmage did not write by way of commandment. I like the way that President J. Reuben Clark always used to handle it in his books. He made it clear that what he was putting out there in written form was not the official commandment of the Lord, even though he was a member of the First Presidency, but that he put it out as his wisdom, his counsel. You see that? And on that basis, then, we should keep things properly separated. See? All right, now. Uh, in, a, in section 43, though, we come back to this, and we have one of the choicest statements in the Church on uh, uh, the role of the living prophet. And uh, 
Here the Lord says, for example, and he begin with verse 4, Verily I say unto you that none else shall be appointed into this gift, that is the gift of revelation, and giving commandments and officially direction. Uh, none else shall be given this, uh, this gift except it be through him, through Joseph, for if it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. And this shall be a law unto you, that you receive not the teachings of any that shall come before you as revelations or commandments. And this I give unto you, that you may not be deceived, that you may know that they are not of me. For verily I say unto you, that he that is ordained of me shall come in at the gate and be ordained as I have told you before to teach these those revelations which you have received and shall receive through him whom I have appointed. And now behold I give unto you a commandment that when ye are assembled together ye shall instruct and edify each other that ye may know how to act and direct my church how to act upon the points of my law and commandments you I have given you. In other words learn the spirit of revelation and how it operates and make that the subject of your of your discussion. And then know what he says as a result of this. Verse 9, And thus ye shall become instructed in the law of my church, and be sanctified by that which ye have received. Now I've said there's two channels of power. One is that which is given to me personally in the ordinances of the gospel. The other then is that channel that's given to me through the living prophet and living priesthood leaders. And if I heed that, then there's power by which I can be sanctified, by which I can gain the mastery of my mortal weaknesses, see, uh, and be sanctified by that which you received, and you shall bind yourselves to act in all holiness before me. But inasmuch as you do this, glory shall be added to the kingdom, spiritual power, life, vitality, dynamics. This will be added to the kingdom, and as much as you do it not, it shall be taken away even that which you shall have received. See? Now this is what we call priesthood ministration, and this is at this point that I put that little statement, the keys of the kingdom constitute the gospel administratively, and uh, there is no salvation as an individual, either without your family, without being sealed to your progenitors and your posterity. Neither is there salvation except through the flow of the Spirit, through living oracles. Now, you have several statements of this kind made by the brethren. Let me just run through one or two of them. Here's one by Elder Faust, James E. Faust. I do not believe, he says, that members of the Church can be in full harmony with the Savior without sustaining his living prophet on the earth, the president of the church. If we do not sustain the living prophet, whoever we may be, we die spiritually. See, it's an issue of life. We die spiritually. Ironically, some have died spiritually by exclusively following prophets who have long been dead. See, there's a dead letter and there's a living letter. He says, others equivocate in their support of living prophets, trying to lift themselves up and putting down the living prophets, however subtly they may act. Here's another one. We have just heard the prophet of God, again from Elder Faust. He is a, watch, he is a watchman on the tower. He has raised a, a warning voice. I would urge all to listen and follow his counsel. It is tremendously important always to be in harmony with those who, according to Paul, have watched for our souls as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Isaiah spoke of the people who did not care to listen to their prophets and seers, who were uh, <clears throat> urged, say to the seers, see not, to the prophets, prophesy not, write things unto us, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Nephi explained, the guilty take of the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. And then from President Kimball, to be a prophet of the Lord, one does not need to be everything to all men. He does not need to be a youthful and athletic, an industrialist, a financier, and an agriculturist. He does not need to be a musician, a poet, an entertainer, nor a banker, a physician, nor a college president, a military general, or a scientist. 
He does not need to be a linguist to speak French and Japanese and German and Spanish, but he must understand the divine language and be able to receive messages from heaven. He need not be an orator, for God can make his own. The Lord can present his divine messages to weak men made strong. He substituted a strong voice for the quiet, timid voice of Moses and gave the young man Enoch power that made men tremble in his presence, for Enoch walked with God as Moses walked with God. The Lord said, Whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it's the same. What the world needs is a prophet leader who gives example, clean, full of faith, godlike in his attributes, with an untarnished name. A uh, beloved husband, a true father, a prophet needs to be more than a priest or a minister or an elder. His voice becomes the voice of God to reveal new programs, new truths, new solutions. I make no claim to infallibility for him, but he does need to be recognized of God and authoritative person. He is no pretender, as numerous are who presumptuously assume positions without appointment and authority that is not given. He must speak like his Lord, as one having authority and not of the scribes. President uh, Benson gives us an example of, of Brigham Young. If I were to characterize Brigham Young, I would call him Joseph Smith's most attentive disciple. Uh, men like Orson Pratt had tremendous minds. Uh, Orson Pratt's learning was recognized by the Royal Society of London. But Brigham Young had this quality of character that he believed. And uh, he just simply accepted everything that Joseph Smith said. But there was one time, apparently, where uh, he had a 15-second relapse, and he talks about that. This is President Benson quoting. It says, President Brigham Young revealed that on one occasion he was tempted to be critical of the prophet Joseph Smith regarding a certain financial matter. And keep in mind that Brigham had some real gifts in this area. He said that the feeling did not last more than, a few, more than perhaps 30 seconds. That feeling, he said, caused him great sorrow in his heart. The lesson he gave to members of the Church in his day may well be increased in significance today because the devil continues more active. I clearly saw and understood, said Brigham Young, by the spirit of revelation manifested to me that it was uh, that if I was to harbor a thought in my heart that Joseph could be wrong in anything, I would begin to lose confidence in him, and that feeling would grow from step to step and from one degree to another until at last I would have the same lack of confidence in his, feet, in his being the mouthpiece of the Almighty. I repented of my unbelief, and that too very suddenly. I repented about as quick as I committed the error. It was not for me to question whether Joseph was dictated by the Lord at, any, at all times and under all circumstances. It was my prerogative to call him. It was not my prerogative to call him in question with regard to any act of his life. He was God's servant and not mine. He did not belong to the people but to the Lord, and was doing the work of the Lord. See, now that's the attitude, and that's the that's the thing I believe that made Brigham Young the man that, that he finally became. Now, President Benson, following in that tradition, gives us this counsel. He says to the Latter-day Saints, The world over we say, Let not your hearts be troubled. Keep the commandments of God. Follow the counsel of his living prophet, taking care not to exceed the counsel with your own private views. I've had some interesting experiences, if I can just take a minute before we conclude, and just recount a few of them. <clears throat> Well, it reminds me a little of my, my great-granddad, for example. He was at Kirtland when uh, the spiritual endowment was poured out there at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. He was a member of the first quorum of 70 at the time. And, and I don't know, he might have taken a little bit casually, because after that dedicatory meeting, he went up to the prophet and says, Hey, I saw all, everyone else speaking in tongues and prophesying and having good But personally, Joseph, I didn't get much myself. Now, what do you think about me? And Joseph says, well, have you really seriously fasted and prayed about it? He said, well, I just came to meet him. No. Uh, and Joseph says, if you want the spirit of revelation, you've got to seek for it. 
Well, he was mature enough at that point he, that he laid siege on that thing. And three days after the dedicatory service, they held the first solemn assembly in the Kirtland Temple. And uh, at that time, then they had another endowment. And my great granddad writes in his journal, I saw fire descend from heaven, and it rested upon us, and we spoke with tongues and prophesied. You see that? Well, later in my mission, uh, after I got out of the North Carolina West District, they put me over into Kentucky, made me a supervising elder of the eastern half of the district of Kentucky, eastern half of the state. And I needed a car. I had a good brother with me who had a car, and I made him my companion so I'd have some wheels. And then he was released to go home, and I needed a pair of wheels. <clears throat> and I got into Lexington. And uh, when I arrived, there was a good brother there who had just bought uh, a used Pontiac in good shape. And he says, I'll give you a couple hundred dollars off on this if you want to buy it. And it looked like a tremendous buy. It was clean outfit and all that, and I just about ready to say it, and then I felt, well, maybe I better counsel with the mission president. So I went to the phone and called him and said, uh, President Richards, I need a car, as you know, and I'm here at Lexington, and his brother has a car, and he's willing to knock off a couple hundred dollars, and just got it the other day, and he wants to sell it to me. Now, uh, what do you think about that? And he pondered for a minute, and he says, Elder, don't buy it. He's about knocking me off the phone because I've got everything going, you know, just to get consent and go buy it. And uh, I says, President, you know, I need a car. He says, yeah, but don't buy it. And I says, is there any reason I shouldn't? He says, well, you need one, but the Spirit says don't buy it. I says, I've had enough audacity to say, President, <laughs> you really feel the Spirit says that? Yes, the boy says it only through the phone. So I hung up, and I went to this good brother and told him, well, I, I can't buy it. He let me take it to drive over to Winchester and back, and when I got back the next day, I found that they had a broken engine block. It would have cost me the, the job of putting in a whole new engine on the thing, see? And besides that, it was wintertime, and a tremendous snowstorm came to Lexington. It piled snow up at least two feet high. And the whole city was just bogged down. And just before the snowstorm, and this was right after World War II, when they started building those old Kaisers. Remember the Kaiser car? But uh, well, there was a Kaiser uh, agency there in Lexington. And the thing had caught fire. And a lot of the cars had been damaged with just uh, uh, the ceiling burning and, and little drops of stuff on the paint and that kind of thing. And they were selling them out. And uh, I got down there, but they said they had them all sold. But there was two of them that hadn't been delivered. And uh, so the only thing I could say is, well, if they don't come pick these up, can I get a chance at them? Because they were selling about half price, and the car at half price. And uh, that night, this two-foot snowstorm hit, and it just piled snow up and everything came to a stop. And what they had told me is if they don't get here, the fellow doesn't get here by next Monday morning, then, I'm, then you can have it. Well, things were all balled up during the weekend. And Monday morning, I got on my boots, and I trod down <clears throat> to the end, and I says, how about those two cars? And he said, well, no one's come in to get one. <laughs> he said, fine, I'll take one. And so I bought a new car for $1,200. <clears throat> but uh, all of the counsel of the Spirit, let me give you another one. I was serving as a bishop in... Well, actually, I served as a, as a bishop in three stakes without being released, all of them on BYU campus. That's when they were really developing building stakes all over the place. I had a stake president by the name of Sidaway, and uh, I'd served for that year, and uh, uh, one of my counselors had moved away, and uh, I needed another counselor. I had at the time a young man working for me who was just a tremendous person. Uh, he went through the BYU testing program with the national academic tests and ranked right up there within the one or two percent of the whole nation. I mean, he was a real solid, dynamic, and, and uh, powerful man, young man. And he was working for me as an assistant. 
and as a research assistant. And so he was in our stake, and the policy of the stake was it doesn't have to be in your ward, it just has to be in the stake. And so I never really thought about who I ought to have as a replacement. I just said, hey, I'm going to have him. You see that? And so I turned his name in to the state presidency. And uh, without really going to the Lord and saying, should I do that? I just turned his name in. And then the state meeting came along, and the state high council was meeting, and uh, there in the same building, on the night building here on campus, my other counselor and I, and this was late toward the summer, and we were preparing now for the new uh, summer session as the students came in in the fall, we were going through, my counselor and I, the other counselor, the list of people that we had to study out and think about who we, I might call as a new counselor. And we were going down the list, one after another. Now, I wasn't thinking about who was calling, pardon, I was just thinking who I was going to call to fill church offices, see, who I wanted to fill in Sunday school for them, and who I wanted for that. And I came down that list, and I came to the name of a young married man, by the name of Ken Higby, who's now a member of the faculty of the BYU. When I got to that name, he had been teaching a Sunday school class, and I hadn't really known him too well, he just came in. When I got to that name, the Spirit, in an audible voice, said, That's the man for your counselor. And that was, that was a tremendously thrilling thing, the power of light and witness and confirmation. Just boom! And I wasn't even... And yet it was a, the most sickening thing I could feel. Because the whole thing came to my mind then, have I counseled with the Lord? And the answer was no. I hadn't counseled with the Lord. And I prayed about it. And the answer was no. Not really. And I turned that name in, and the high counselor was meeting next door to clear my name for a counselor. To clear the name I had proposed. And there the spirit of revelation told me that the guy I have as a counselor was Ken Higby. And I just sat back, you know, in the midst of, of the beauty of the revelation and the agony of my soul. The compound of the two just churned within me, literally churned within me. And then I just said, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And then, being a radical oddball that I am, I got the thing, I wonder what the state presence is going to be to do about that name that I turn in. I wonder whether they're just going to stamp it automatically, like I did. I wonder what's going to happen there. And instead of rushing down there and saying, hey, fellas, I made a mistake, I just figured and decided I'd ride the thing through and see what happened. And so after the meeting was over, I went in. The state president was talking with some of the brethren there, and I kind of stood and waited my turn. And when uh, I walked up to him finally, how are you, President? We shook hands, and, and uh, I told him I'd been meeting next door, talking, discussing things with my other counselor about who we ought to have as ward members. And then I was just about ready to get around, and I said, President, did you consider the name that I, that I submitted? He says, yes, we considered it. And at that point, then someone else came up, and he just willingly left me off and went talking with this other guy. <coughs> And he kind of left me standing there. And so when he guys went through the process of listening again and waiting, and when he got through, I sided up to him again. And after a few more comments of introduction, and I slid into the theme again, now present, I came this name, and I, did you can, yeah, we considered that. You discussed it, yeah, we, we discussed it. And again, no response. And finally, he walked out of the door, and so I walked after him. I followed him way out into the parking lot. And finally, when he got to the car and got his hand on the door, then I finally faced him up to the issue. I says, President, I submitted a name. Now, can you tell me what you're feeling on it? And he finally, hesitantly, but finally just screwed up his courage and turned around and looked me square in the eye and he says, Bishop, he says, uh, we felt that maybe you ought to give some reconsideration to that call. And then I told him the story. And we had a beautiful experience together, see. 
Now that's the spirit of revelation, see? Now a person who isn't in tune with that, and who isn't living in tune with that, cannot be exalted. He may grow theologically, but he can't grow in that substance, line upon line, precept upon precept, that finally internalizes not just the theology, but the processes of the kingdom of God in his life. You can't do that unless your focus is on the living prophet, see? And uh, that's my testimony, that that's what we're dealing with. First of all, we're dealing with a living church, with living channels. I bear you my testimony, we have a prophet of God, and he's a living prophet. And we've, uh, in our state, compiled a list of his teachings, inspired messages from all of his teachings, and these messages have done more for our state than any one thing we've done for a long while. Because when people really study what President Benson has said, they, found, they find the spirit of revelation there, and they begin to apply it, and it changes their lives. I may the Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters. If there are any questions, maybe we conclude, and you can just come up and we can deal with them afterward. The Church of the Firstborn is that inner church into which we enter by making our calling and election sure and are sealed unto eternal life. People who enter the Church of the Firstborn do so through the sealing powers of the Holy Priesthood. And the spiritual blessings that are available to them are those that pertain to the second comforter, the opening of the veil being taught by uh, the spirits of just men made perfect, angels, uh, the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, Christ, and even the Father can minister him. And so one then is the outer church, which is of a contingent nature. The other is the inner church of those who are sealed. Could you expand uh, on learning by the Spirit, by our educational processes today? For example, certain subjects like algebra and science. Uh, let me suggest, if you want to learn by the Spirit, really thoroughly master Alma 32 and 33. Now, not just the one chapter, but Alma. Planting the seed uh, and making the experiment. Faith, then, is the capacity to probe into the realm of the Spirit and to open the revelatory power of the Spirit into your life. See? And you have to do it line upon line and precept upon precept. It comes through prayer, through study through obedience, through commitment, and then through reaching and having your, your focus in the right direction. The speaking in tongues and fire from heaven, as your great grandfather experience ever happened nowadays? Well, there are occasions. I was talking, for example, to a good brother in the Jordan Temple. He used to be president of the stake in Berlin after World War II, when President Benson was then European president of the Church. President Benson couldn't talk German, and this brother couldn't talk English, but he had to get a hold of him. Uh, no, it was the other way about. President Benson called him, called this good brother, and this good brother suggested that maybe they ought to get an elder who could translate for them with them on the phone. And President Benson says, no, don't worry about that. And they talked for 20 minutes and understood each other perfectly, except when they started talking about personal things. When they talked about official things, they could understand. When they talked about personal things, neither one could understand the other. Now, well, this good brother told me that story himself. I've been trying to get him to write it up. If the Church is a living body, and if we are truly infused with this life, then are we part of the body of Christ? And the answer is yes, in the sense that we are partakers or co-heirs of his glory. That's true. That's how you become co-heirs with Christ, because you, you come into that program and partake of that life. Then does it also follow that if we are cut off from the body, we have done it by rebellion? Are we therefore no longer partakers of the glory because we have rejected? And the answer is yes. It's a part of a living system. It's like cutting off your home from the, from the telephone wire or from the electrical line outside. The fridge doesn't work any longer, see? You're cut off. Uh, you spoke of no resurrection after those resurrected at the time of the, Savior, of the Savior's resurrection. Do we understand, then, that the prophet Joseph has not yet been resurrected? And I don't know, and you can quote me. My understanding of that, though, is 
that there will be those who are resurrected prior to the coming of Christ to the Mount of Olives. And I believe personally, as a matter of personal belief, that Joseph Smith will be one of those. Thanks a lot. See you. So the people can leave, and I'll, if anyone wants to conclude, stay while we'll, we'll deal with these after that, because time has passed. Brother Jim Ballard, do you this Church of Jesus Christ is that organization into which we enter by baptism and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and the basic uh, medium of ministry to us as individuals spiritually is the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Church of the Firstborn 